This morning's scripture reading will be found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. That's 1 Thessalonians chapters 1, verses 1 through 10. Paul and Silvanus and Timothy, unto the church of Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all you, making mention to all of you in our prayers. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, before our God the F and Father, knowing, brethren, beloved of God, your election, how that our gospel came not unto you in, wor in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit, and in much assurance. Even as you knew what manner of men sh we showed ourselves toward you for your sake, and ye became imitators of us, and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction, with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that ye came before an, an example to all in, that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you hath sounded forth the word from the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place your, your faith to God is gone forth, so that we not to speak anything. For they themselves report concerning us what manner of entering in what we had unto you, and how ye turned unto God from idols to serve a living and true God, and to wait for, the son, wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivered us from the wrath to come. You may be seated. What a wonderful day and an opportunity for us to be able to be together. And if you have never had the opportunity to worship with us here at South Trail, we are honored to have you as our guest. And we look forward to every Lord's Day to be able to worship and exalt our God. And so we're glad that you're here. We hope that you'll come back at every opportunity to worship together with us uh, in the future. When Daryl had that little difficulty with the number of the song, uh, it... Uh, I had to fess up and say Marsha's out of town so nobody can blame Marsha. That means that uh, somehow I mistyped that number. And I thought about a story that I'd heard. A guy was interviewing for a job and the manager said, you know, we're looking for somebody who really can be responsible. I hope you fit that description. The man looked, he said, oh yes. He said, I can be very responsible. In fact, he said on my previous job, everything that went wrong, they said I was responsible. So I thought about that as I uh, obviously mistyped the number, but I appreciate your patience with both uh, Daryl and myself uh, with that this morning. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and, as Caleb read for us from 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, I want us to look at this, the first chapter, and, and we'll be doing a series going through 1 and 2 Thessalonians over the next couple of months, Lord willing. Our society is pretty enamored with a DIY. That is, do it yourself. People want to be able to do it yourself. But there are things that we just can't do by ourselves. I don't know how many different projects, you know, I'm trying to work with something and I need an extra set of hands. There's just something about having someone else. And so <clears throat> when we're encouraged to read dozens and there are thousands of self-help books, I, I didn't bother to look it up, but I would imagine that there are tens of thousands of self-help books and every one of those we're encouraged that if we'll just read this book it'll fix everything it'll change everything that needs to be changed can I tell you that rather than a DIY a do-it-yourself culture we need a DIWG do it with God in fact one of the hardest parts in life is to admit that I can't do it. I can't do it by myself. I can't do it for myself. I can't do it without God. And once you make that admission that you need God and that God has the answers that you are seeking, then your life can begin the improvement, the blessings. The channel will be open for God to fill you with those things spiritually that he wants for you and I to have. In Acts chapter 17, we see the beginning of the church at Thessalonica. 
In the previous chapter, in Acts 16, Paul had a vision. And there was a man from Macedonia who in that vision said, come over and help us. And Paul and Silas and Luke and Timothy made their way on this second missionary journey of Paul's over into what we call Macedonia. This was the beginning of the gospel in Europe, northern Greece. And there they went to a city of Philippi. And there, when they were going to pray to worship, on the Lord's Day, they, they met Lydia and some others. And they there taught them the gospel, and they were converted. And they had the opportunity as they were going around the city to preach to others. And there was a slave girl who was possessed with a, a spirit, an evil spirit, who went around behind them and she said, these men are the servants of the Most High God. She had the right message, but she had the wrong reputation to support them in that work. And so Paul cast out that evil spirit, but of course the people who were making money off of this young woman were very upset. They had Paul and Silas arrested and thrown in jail. And you remember what happened there in Acts 16 as Paul was in jail that night. They're singing hymns and praising God at midnight and the jailers are listening. I mean, the prisoners are listening, and all of a sudden there's an earthquake, and the doors open, and the jailer, believing that the prisoners have escaped, was ready to kill himself, and Paul preached the gospel, and when he did, they obeyed the gospel, and the same hour of the night, they were baptized there in Acts 16, 33. But the brethren wanted to protect Paul from any further injury or, or, or problems and punishment or persecution so they sent Paul away, and he went to the city of Thessalonica there in Acts 17. And he began three consecutive Sabbath days. He went into the synagogue and was there trying to, to reason with them. That means he went back to the Old Testament, and he was showing them how Jesus had fulfilled the Scripture. He explained it to them so that they could see the direct correlation between the promises and Jesus Christ as the Messiah. He persuaded them. And there we read that there was a great multitude of devout Greeks and there were not a few leading women who were persuaded by Paul's presentation and proclamation of the gospel then. What we see is that there are some Jews who stir up the crowd. They go down to the marketplace and they hire some rascals to stir up the people and they get a mob, an uproar in the city. And what they say there in Acts 17 and verse 6 is, these who have turned the world upside down have come here too. And you think about that, who have turned the world upside down. Is that really what preaching the gospel does? Well, I would say it turns things right side up. It makes the world look the way God intended for it to look as we have a, a renewal and a reconciliation, a regeneration back to God. But because of that, Paul was driven out of the city and so all we know is that Paul spent at least three weeks, maybe a little bit longer, but we don't know that he spent any more appreciable time in the city of Thessalonica, and he goes on to Berea, and then to Athens, and then to Corinth in Acts 18. Within a few months, Paul receives some news that the church at Thessalonica, the Thessalonians, they have some questions. After all, they didn't get a, a very long grounding in the faith. So their maturity is challenged. There's some persecution. And so that's causing some intimidation and a question of whether they'll remain faithful. There's some charges against Paul. And there are some questions about the return of Jesus that they are very enthusiastic to anticipate Jesus' return. All of these things are what Paul's trying to address in this letter of 1 Thessalonians. But if there was ever a church that had an excuse... If there was ever a church that, that had an excuse just to give up, throw in the towel, quit, and die, it was the church at Thessalonica. But what we see, as Paul writes to them, is they weren't quitters. They weren't just passing Christians. It wasn't something where there was just a little bit of, of, of thin soil there where the seed had gone in and, and sprung up, but there was some depth. And there was some real desire and love for God. And so what Paul begins this letter as he writes to them is trying to encourage them to overcome. As they had gone back around on the first missionary journey to the churches, they were strengthening the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, we must through many tribulations enter into the kingdom of God, there in Acts 14, 22. And in that same spirit, 
Paul is, is writing to the Thessalonians that they would enter, that not the tribulations would, would kill the faith, but that they would recognize that this is just Satan's way of opposing the truth, and it needed to be preached all the more and practiced as examples of the faith in the first century. One thing that's interesting about Thessalonica is from the city you could see Mount Olympus, where there were idols, where Zeus was to be worshipped, where these many Greek gods had been taught, the philosophies had been propagated among these people for a long time, for centuries. And here we've got these people all of a sudden come to know the one true and living God. There's something there that now that they know the truth, they don't want to let go of. In our world today, just like Mount Olympus, we've got a lot of different idols that are offered out in the world. And there are things that are distractions. There are different types of things that people can worship. And if you watch any of your neighbors, if you talk to very many people who are just entrenched in the way that the world thinks and lives, you see the idols that people have exchanged the knowledge of God for in their own lives today. I would say that it reminds me very much of what they experienced in the first century. And yet the gospel, and particularly at Thessalonica, the gospel spread. It wasn't the end. It didn't kill the church. There were those who said, this is the truth, and we're going to love it. And we're going to practice it. And we're going to teach it to others. What is it that makes a conversion last? Look with me here at chapter 1 of 1 Thessalonians. And I want you to notice in these first few verses, look at verse 4. He says, knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God. We need to know the election of God. God drew a circle. There was a plan that God had. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We recognize that believing in Jesus Christ is not just a passing thing. It's not just saying, yeah, 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 Jesus. No, it's recognizing that because of sin, the need for a Savior was very real. And God demonstrated his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5.8. The plan that God had was before the foundation of the world. Jesus was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world, before the need even existed, before you and I were born, before we had ever exercised our free will and chosen to go out of bounds from God and his righteousness. God said, I know what you need. You need a Savior. And God sent Jesus. And if we understand that that's the election of God, that by grace you've been saved through faith, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. It is salvation is by God's grace. God had to act first. That makes salvation available. That means that there is a way, there's a bridge, and then the invitation is presented through the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The good news is that there's a way into having a saved relationship with God. There's a way back. You wandered, and now you need to come home. And Jesus Christ, the plan of God is in Jesus. So in Christ, every spiritual blessing is found, Ephesians 1.3. When you understand that that election is in Christ, then you understand how the sovereignty of God works along with the free will of man it isn't that God just determined individuals. It's that God drew the circle and he said, now if you want salvation, step into it. I'm inviting you. I'm offering this to you. I want it to be known far and wide to every person in the world where salvation is found. And it's in Jesus Christ. And if we understand what that means, we understand the very purpose of God. And what the Thessalonians did was they had a deep conviction. Look at what it says here in verse 5. For our gospel did not come to you in word only. We know faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But he says, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. The preaching of the gospel 
is that it's inspired by the Holy Spirit. It is God's word. It came through power. There were signs that confirmed and, and, and made sure that people knew that this was authentic. But Paul says, you saw us too. And their example was consistent with what that message is. When someone is drowning and someone throws them a life preserver and they grab hold, they're exercising a choice. And when they're pulled to safety, they don't immediately reach safety and say, look what I did. No. By the plan of God, salvation is made known in every person who becomes a child of God. Every person who receives the salvation of their soul says, that's by the grace of God. That's what God provided. And to live that way means to rest, to trust what God has provided. No one is able to provide what they need, but in Jesus Christ they find what God has provided. Someone has said that Christianity is better caught than taught. If you look at what Paul says, they were modeling the faith. It takes exemplary lives, people who are convicted and have therefore the enthusiasm of saying, I know where this blessing is. This gift of God is found. And by having that enthusiasm, they want to share it with everyone they meet. And our lives parallel the message that we preach. Our walk and our talk must line up. Our preaching must line up with the example that we're trying to give. Now, I know when I say that, some of you are going, but Terry, I'm not perfect. And then maybe one or two of you say, well, maybe you are. Can I tell you? We know we're not perfect. We recognize we need the grace of God. But because we have tasted the good gift of God, because we have, have received that heavenly gift, it's all of a sudden, it's the very tenor by which we live our lives. Holy lives. Lives of love and dedication for God. What we see in the Thessalonians is that locals teach locals. Where you live, is where your example reaches others. Paul makes it very clear that the example mattered. What kind of people are we? Look at verse 8. He says, For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth. That phrase, sounded forth, means to make the sound of a trumpet. What kind of a sound does a trumpet make? It's a very soft instrument, kind of like a flute, right? Not hardly. When a trumpet sounds, everybody hears it. In fact, that's why they use that to, to get up and call people in the military to get ready. Because you won't miss the trumpet. It's sharp. It's loud. And those who are living for Christ, their lives make a difference to the people around them. 70 to 80% of those who are converted are converted because friends tell friends. People tell people they know. It's not stranger evangelism. It's friendship evangelism. It's talking to people who live next door, across the street, that you work next door to, or, or in the cubicle or the office next to you. It's people that you mingle with, you mix with all the time. And your example matters. Question. A couple of weeks ago, I put in the bulletin that we had at least no less than 30 couples in this congregation who have been married for 50 years or more. At least 10 of those couples have been married 60 years or more. Now, in a society where marriage has become disposable, where people throw aside their vows, their covenant, quickly, what kind of example is that among the, the church here? To have people who have been steadfast, who have been faithful, who have honored what marriage represents, is that not something that we say, now that's, that's a good example. That's a powerful testimony of what marriage is supposed to be. We recognize that. We honor that. In your life, there are areas of your life that you are recognized. You have contact with other people. I'm going to bring up something, and, and, and maybe I'm going to step in it, all right? And, and I hope nobody has any rotten tomatoes with them today. 
let me ask you this. Is it possible that people might get to know you at least on the surface or, or maybe by your example from Facebook, from the things that you post on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter? Is it possible that social media might give somebody an introduction at least to know something about you? Is what you put on Facebook the example that you want to be known for being? Is that who you are? Your example all the time matters. When you wear the name of Christ, when you are a Christian, a child of God, your example matters all the time. People are watching. In Bible class this morning, Joyce Mingus mentioned the fact that people have asked her, they said, why do you go to church three times a week? Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. You know, like clockwork. When people see that you do things regularly, routinely, what do they see in that example? Do they know something about what matters to you? Do they know something about what you believe? Do they see something in your example that all of a sudden causes them to maybe ask a question? Opens a door. Opens up a conversation with who you are. The old saying is that everyone is born an original, but dies a copy. And what that means is you're being influenced. There are examples that you've watched. There are examples that you've learned from. There are people that have influenced your life, and you are also an example. What kind of example are you? Paul says in verse 7, so that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. In other words, in the northern province of Greece and even to the south, this, this is trumpeted out. People know your example has gone far and wide. What kind of an example are we giving? I want you to look with me quickly what sustains spiritual growth. In verse 3, Paul had mentioned remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope. Look with me over at verse 9. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you and how you turned to God from idols. If we were to look at that in verse 3, their work of faith was that they had turned to God from idols. There is something we need to believe. Everybody needs to believe something. Everybody needs to have some idea of why you're here, where you came from, and what you're here for, and where you're going. And that need to believe starts with God. Just like you have in math and in numbers, and I can guarantee you that if the bank messes up where the decimal place is in your bank account, okay, especially if they move that decimal place over to the left a, a, a place or two, you're going to scream. You're going to go, no! The need to believe. People want to know what's real. They want to know what is absolutely genuine. And believing in God is the foundation of everything that we see in the world. People need to believe. And Paul says the work of faith is that we hear a message from God and we trust God. Turn from idols. I mentioned Mount Olympus and what the Greeks had. Look at the idols in our world today, whether it's popularity or pleasure or sex or money or, or peer pressure, whether it's political correctness. The world wants to put as many different idols, and you can fall, you can bow before any of those altars if you choose. Or you can say, no, God is number one in my life. God is the priority. I'm going to seek first God, His righteousness, His kingdom, and everything else is just going to have to stay on the side. If we put first things first, People will know what we believe. In Acts chapter 3, when Peter was preaching the next recorded sermon, he said, Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, and that you may receive refreshing that will come from the presence, times of refreshing that will come from the presence of the Lord. That repenting, the Thessalonians turned. They were converted. And it was something that was a work of faith because they're turning from idols. Everybody knew that their belief was now in the true and living God. Biblical faith, in the way it's used in the Bible, exists in various degrees. 
There's not different kinds of faith. It's in various degrees. And our faith can be weak or our faith can be strong, and it should be growing. Is your faith greater today than it was six months ago, last year, five years ago, ten years ago? Is your faith stronger today than when you came up out of the waters of baptism, or are you still just that same babe in Christ? Is your faith growing? The need to believe, the world needs something to believe, and they need to see our example that what we believe is real. Dr. John Mitchell was a boy, and he knew the mountains and the, the mine pits around where he grew up, and so he was in the Boy Scout troop, and one night they had gone out on some, a midnight hike. And John Mitchell, because he knew the area so well, he went off on a couple of jaunts just by himself. And when he came back after the second or third one, the scoutmaster said, John, I need to talk to you. John was like, what's the problem? And the scoutmaster said, I know that you know the area, and I know that you know where the mine pits are and you can avoid them, but if others follow you, that may lead to their death. Is your faith the kind of example that others can follow? Is your faith in God and God alone? Have you set aside the idols so that others can know that what you worship is God? They need to believe. And they need to see your example. You exercise faith all the time. You go to a doctor, and I know recently there have been more doctors that I can't even pronounce their name. They've got degrees up on the wall that I have never verified. They write a prescription that again, I may not even be able to pronounce. I go to a pharmacist, and again, I don't verify the pharmacist's degrees. The pharmacist fulfills that prescription, and gives me a compound that I don't know all that's in it. But when I take that medication, I take that medication by faith that it's gonna help me. And I will tell you that when it comes to our faith in God, I have a far greater understanding that what God has said is what God means. And what God has told me is what he wants me to know. And what I know from God's word and what I understand is absolutely certain it is true. And I can put my faith in it. Secondly, we need to love and we need to be loved. He says here that you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Back in verse 3, he said your labor of love. Love, putting the highest and best for others ahead of what's maybe my self-interest, maybe what, what my own pride would tell me to want, to be able to love others. That love is something real. To be able to say that the church, that it is the pillar and the ground of the truth, I am serving the true and living God. We're told to love one another as God has loved us. Jesus said, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another even as I have loved you. We need to love. Can I tell you that trying to hold back anger is work? Can I tell you that being able to forgive at all times is work? Can I tell you that wanting to put someone else ahead of myself is work? When Paul says that's a labor of love, he's not kidding. There's effort. There is work to love others genuinely to want what is best for them, to make that a habit, to develop that love. Love is the most redeeming, healing, fulfilling force in all the world. It's more how we act than just how we feel. I will tell you that every parent has learned that their love for their child is not just subjective, because they love their child even when that child frustrates, hurts, disappoints, they continue to love. And God loves us, and our love ought to show. Thirdly, we need to look forward to the future. Notice what he says in verse 10, and to wait for his son from heaven. That is the patience of hope that he mentioned in verse 3, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. The patience of hope. I will tell you the world needs hope. They need to look forward to the future, and the only future is in Jesus Christ. We need to somehow help people that that is expectation. 
We talk about the example. We talk about the enthusiasm. We talk about the expectation. Jesus Christ is going to return. He's coming back. And you and I need to live like he's coming back. We need to expect. We need to be waiting. I had a friend at, at Harding one time. Neil was walking around and just looking up into the sky. I said, Neil, what are you doing? He said, I'm waiting for Jesus to come back. I thought, Neil has lost something. A little dose of reality. But can I tell you that as I've thought back on that over the last <clears throat> so many years, more than 30 years now, I can realize that there's something about what Neil was doing that I need to have every single day. No, I don't need to walk around looking up into the sky, but I need to live like he's coming back. And every day, that expectation not only helps me with my endurance, but it helps me to be able to serve those around me. When we look at what Paul was speaking to the church at Thessalonica, there was a church that had an excuse to die, but it wasn't ready to die. And I will tell you that every congregation goes through periods of ups and downs as long as they're able to exist for very long. But the fact is that when we look at the Thessalonians, what sustained their growth, what kept them maturing spiritually, is the same thing that we need. We need to turn to the living God from idols. We need to serve in love, and we need to wait for the return of Jesus. Many years ago, famous New York diamond broker Harry Winston heard about a Dutch merchant. He was very wealthy, and he was looking for a particular diamond. And, and Harry Winston went through his collection and, and his inventory. He was able to find a diamond that he thought the Dutch merchant would want. So he called him and communicated with him, and he came to New York City to see this diamond. And Harry Winston had set up his very best salesman to sit there and to present this to this Dutch merchant. And this salesman was very good at the four C's, the cut, the color, the clarity, and the carrots. And he talked technically with this Dutch merchant for quite a while, presenting this diamond and going over all the technical perfection of this diamond. And at the end of the presentation, the Dutch merchant looked at it and he said, you know, he said, I don't think this is the stone that I want. And he got up and he was ready to leave. Harry Winston had stayed off to the side and had observed the whole presentation. He came over quickly and he asked the Dutch merchant, he said, can you give me just a minute to talk about this diamond with you? And the Dutch merchant sat back down and Harry Winston went over, talked about this diamond and its beauty and talked about it in such a way that the Dutch merchant said, I do want it, and he bought it. But then the Dutch merchant looked at Harry Winston and he said, why, after you presented the diamond, did I want to buy it, but your salesman, I could so easily reject it from him. And Harry Winston said this. He said, my salesman is probably the best technician around. He knows more about diamonds than I do, but there is a difference. He said, he knows diamonds, but I love them. I love them. I will tell you that in your life, you can know Jesus. You can know about Jesus. But the question is going to be, if you're going to live for Jesus, you're going to have to love Jesus. This morning, do you love Jesus? Do you love Jesus? If you want to obey the gospel, it would be so simple for you to step down and make your confession of faith. Turn from your sins and be buried with Jesus in the waters of baptism to become a child of God. If this morning you as a Christian, you've done that, and yet there's things in your life that have interfered, and, and there are idols that have come back in your life, and you realize that your example is not what others can see, your love for Jesus in you, renew your commitment today. If we can encourage you in any way, just step down to the front. We'll be glad to assist you right now. We're going to sing a song to encourage you. If you need to come, come now while we stand and while we sing.